Well, good afternoon or good evening, depending on, of, on where you're joining from. And welcome to that session on COVID pandemic and the force of impact investing. So our moderator did not show up, uh, but Christina Alfonso Ergan is with us. So Christina, do you mind, uh, first of all, introducing yourself? Sure. Um, <laughs> thank you, Fabrice. Uh, my name is Christina Alfonso Arjan. I'm uh, based in New York, and I was originally the co-founder and CEO of a company called Madeira Global, which was an ESG advisory and reporting firm. And most recently, in the last year and a half, I've been working with a company called Novata as the co-founder and CFO, most recently um, transitioning to a, to a senior advisor role. And that company is a technology SaaS platform that's focused on um, ESG reporting for the private markets. So you're, you're in the middle of the storm because ESG <laughs> is the, the trendy topic. And so my name is Fabrice Udart and I, I work at the World Bank for uh, um, most of my life, most of my career for 14 years. And then I was in the office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. And now I uh, had a small investment, impact investing investment fund that is specialized in LGBTQ uh, issues, which is a uh, a bit of a niche in impact investing, uh, but, but it's relevant to the, to the topic today. So, Christina, maybe my first question to you is, do you have the feeling that everybody started talking about ESG in the past year? You know, why do you explain the fact that companies seem to have discovered the ESG agenda in the past year or so? You know, what has changed that led to that conversation becoming uh, kind of mainstream. Yeah. Well, I started um, with, you know, impact investing. It wasn't quite called ESG yet. My first company was uh, started in 2012. And I would say at that time, even though we were focused on a lot of private investments, private equity and private credit, I would say that the, most of the demand was coming from family offices and multifamily offices who had capital in that post-recessionary environment to allocate. And they were oftentimes, at least the ones that I had exposure to, were often in a position where they had a family foundation or some sort of philanthropy initiative that had a social or environmental mission. And they were starting to consider applying a similar scope or, or lens or objective to their private investments. Um, and so we were, were working to match them with um, asset managers that were willing to create bespoke impact portfolios for them. That was what I saw in that 2010 to 12 era. I would say where we've advanced today and over the course of the pandemic, I think, you know, we have more access to data and information that just tells us, you know, what is the state of sort of climate and the advancements towards the climate challenges um, some of the predictions around how much time do we have left or what are some of the constraints with natural resources um, and so some of those um, social crises or environmental crises, I think we're just more aware of. I think the pressure has, again, from my observations and experience, gone from that sort of family office or those with a little bit more ag agility and leverage um, to, you know, pressuring asset managers to now trickling to even retail consumers, investors, and then ultimately um institutional investors. And I think that's where the pressure for public companies is starting to increase demand. I don't think there is a Fortune 500 company that doesn't have some sort of, you know, we've settled on ESG as the acronym that seems to capture, you know, social responsibility, environmental, all of that. Um, I think we've, we've landed on that being at least part of the marketing focus, if not legitimately part of some of the corporate strategy focus. So um, I, I would I would imagine that that's just a matter of time and then also a matter of sort of our awareness combined with the number of stakeholders that have um, entered this this sort of chain reaction. You, so you, you mentioned the fact that there is maybe more of a conscience that the private sector has an impact on the environment and also on the social issues uh, that, that are pressing today. But, but do you think also there is a generational issue? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you an example is that when I was at the World Bank, I had no idea where my pension was invested. And in mm -hmm. fact, I was not very interested, right? Of course, I would look at what was the return, but it never occurred to me to look at, oh, are we investing in armaments? Are we investing in tobacco? And I remember that one day, a young professional that joined the company started challenging the pension fund. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, where is the money invested? 
you know, is it matching the values of the bank and the mission of the bank of, you know, shared prosperity? And I was kind of baffled. I was like, I never even thought about it. Do you think that young people, individuals, are much more aware of the need for their investment to match their values and their goals for cycling? Yeah, I think you're smart to bring this point up early in our session. I think that two things have happened over the course of the last 10 years that has led to some material change, even in just these recent couple of years. And that is that over the last decade, millennials and Gen Zs have grown up. They've entered the workforce and they've actually started to have, you know, purchasing power um, as consumers. At the same time, technology advancements and innovation in things like social media have given individuals a platform and a voice. I would say 10 to 15 years ago, a company was not afraid of a teenager in Wyoming with a Twitter account. I would say today that has changed pretty dramatically. And I think that um, companies are wise to um, be mindful that anything that they do within their supply chain, how they treat their employees, um, how they use resources or, or pollute the environments um, is something that could end up not just on the cover of the New York Times, but could, you know, quote unquote, go viral. So you mentioned the fact that that you've been in the space very, from the point of view of reporting, right, which is kind of fascinating mm -hmm. Because a lot of what we read in the past year is that it's impossible to distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys, right? Meaning that yes. a lot of companies are saying, look, we are a, a socially conscious company or we are an environmentally conscious company, but it's difficult for the lay person, you know, even as a consumer, to figure out who is really doing the work and who is just saying, Oh look, we are uh, pro racial equality. We are uh, we are ensuring that you're, we are using uh, renewable energy, and but nobody can really check. So, so what is the bottleneck? Do you think that companies are intentionally keeping the water muddy, and 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 you know what are the developments on reporting that that will make us more able to measure what is really happening? Mm -hmm. well, I think companies like um, Novada, uh, welcome Anna. Um, companies like Novada are, are just an example of, you know, the way in which, you know, demand is being met with supply for tools for reporting. I think companies are feeling that pressure to communicate to stakeholders what they are doing, what measures, practices, policies they do have um, that are specific to ESG and, and that they want to show progress and be, in some cases, proactive as opposed to reactive Um, and then the only other thing that I would say is that um, we we're seeing specific impacts. Take a company like you know Twitter, for example. Um, you have one person uh, like Elon Musk who can be a major influencer in the value of the stock in a matter of you know hours or days. Um, so I think all of this sort of leads to um, the importance of reporting. Financial reporting, as we've always depended on, but now entering into the equation, financial reporting for the way in which we comprehensively value a company. So I know I'm, I'm going to give you back the floor, but basically yes. we discuss the fact that that there is increasing pressure on companies to demonstrate, uh, you know, what is their track record on ESG, uh, and particularly a generational pressure. And then Christina was talking about the fact that um, that you know th there is a need to measure what companies are doing and that there is actually more tools. Uh, there's increasingly tools to, to measure, you know, who is doing well and who is doing poorly on ESG. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fabrice. Thank you, Christina. I think one, one of the impact investment areas that I think we need to, to address is investment in technology so that uh, you know, we can have some smoother experience. But I'm uh, really happy to be with, uh, with both of you and uh, assume my moderator roles. And uh, so I'm Anna Tanko. I'm the head of uh, Strategic Partnerships and Global Engagement at Appco Worldwide. Uh, we're an advisory um, company that sits at the intersection of business strategy, advocacy, and communications, and we're operating across more than uh, 60 markets. And so gl glad to have more of a comparative uh, perspective to this topic. And uh, we've, um, we've been doing a lot of work in the ESG space, but also more broadly um, 
um, how it translates to to business strategy and, and and broader impact, and I think you know from my perspective we're looking at um, almost a twofold uh, directions. On the one hand, we have um, uncertainty that was triggered by by COVID, but also um, really uh, jump started significant opportunities in in the area of impact investment. Um, I think according to, to recent estimates by the International Finance Corporation, um, the market is estimated about 2.1 uh, trillion. And with uh, what we're witnessing post-pandemic in economic inequality, climate crisis, uh, gender disparity and racial injustice, um, we actually have a 2.5 trillion gap in addressing the sustainable development goals. Um, and so increasingly um, governance, governments that will be running lower on, on cash, and I think especially as we're looking at the economic uh, downturn, uh, there will be an increased reliance on private sector capital um, to, to fund the sustainable development goals. And uh, from my perspective, I think there are, there are a couple of key, key trends that I would love to, you know, to discuss with, with both of you, given your experience and, and where you sit. I think one is the increasing importance of the S in ESG and sort of the social aspect, and uh, um, especially given uh, the rise of, uh, of inequality, economic downturn, um, and uh, just broader social fragmentation that we're seeing all around the world um, in, in recent years. Um, some, of, some of the work that we've also been doing through through the World Economic Forum and other uh, forests focused on the governance uh, question and, um, and you know, one of the topics that we've uh, also been, been discussing with, with both of you and, and the role of the board today in uh, both um, advancing corporate governance, but also the, the role of corporate governance in and of itself has been changing. And so how are we looking at um, CO compensation, performance measures, workforce conditions? Um, I think are all of those things are um, the, the, the components that, uh, that we ought to be discussing. Um, so with technology difficulties or not, I'm not sure if uh, you, you got a chance to, to introduce yourselves and, and your backgrounds. Um, no, we, you? did. we did, yeah. We did. Audio, audio. Well, let's jump uh, right in then, because I think I would love to just pick up uh, the conversation and uh, um, and really get your sense on, I guess, how, how we define uh, impact investing today and sort of, and the, exactly the intersection, maybe setting the table, so to speak, um, uh, the intersection of Impact investing and ESG are the two uh, the same things, the same direction. And how would you uh, define those critical priorities today? So perhaps, um, uh, you know, Christina, starting with you. I actually got to speak plenty while he, while Fabrice was <laughs> moderating, so I'd love for Fabrice to answer that question first. Okay, uh, sure. That, that, that's so nice of you. Uh, that's nice of you, Christina. Well, I, I think you know ESG is really uh, ensuring that companies have a positive impact on the environment, on the environment, on social issues, and then and, um, and on governance issues, right? And so, meaning that companies do not have to have an aim to support a particular uh, solution to a, a societal issues, but they have to ensure that they don't have a negative impact. It's kind of the do not harm uh, principle, right? On the other hand, I think impact investing goes one step further, right? You are, you are basically ensuring that your capital is advancing something specific, right? So impact investing, gender impact investing, as an example, would make sure to invest in companies either led by women or have a positive impact on, uh, on women. And then similarly, uh, you could imagine using your, uh, your uh, uh, investment tool as a way to advance a uh, uh, you know, a, a specific environmental issue you care about. Uh, so I think, you know, to me, ESG is, uh, is, is kind of the bare minimum, ensuring that companies are contributing to a better world. And impact investing goes one step further, which is to leverage the power of capital to uh, push a specific issue um, uh, that you are, um, th th that you believe in. Um, so, you know, I, I really believe that we are kind of progressing from just ESG to trying to solve societal issue with the power of uh, capital. So, Christina, I don't know that that can you know I didn't really prepare, so that sort of <laughs> kind of came from the top of my head. But I would love to hear your take on it. Um, how would you like me to expand upon Anna? And um, okay, so so I'm I'm really love to our conversation. <laughs> Yes, and uh, and you've been doing so much work in, in this space, and you know both uh, Madeira and, and you know previously. Uh, I guess would love your again 
take on what impact investing means today to you? Um, I mean, I think that in, impact is still considered to be in the eye of the beholder. I think um, what we're catering to right now is companies and in particular public companies, because I think that we are in a pre-gap era of regulatory reporting requirements for ESG, but that should change. We expect it to. And I think that um, I've primarily, my experience has been with um, the you know private markets um, and the majority of the world's capital is, is dedicated to private businesses. And so I think that that's where we've really been able to move the needle, but ultimately public companies do have um, you know, more of a platform to be able to influence the way resources are used. Um, and one of the things that I'm spending more time on is actually how to work with boards, uh, corporate boards on, um, you know, what they're seeing in terms of ESG items that are appearing on the corporate board agenda, um, because they are a very small group of people who are, you know, have the responsibility of the oversight and the governance um, of, you know, trillions of dollars of public company capital. Um, and so it's really important that they are very, very clear on these ESG issues, their priority, their importance, and then how they can best guide the executive management teams of these companies to, um, you know, to set policies and practices that, um, that govern these businesses well and hopefully give them some sustainable growth in the future. And actually, maybe following up on this, and, and Fabrice, I would love to, to come to you also on, on the topic of uh, of equality and uh, how do you measure this uh, shortly, just given you know your tremendous uh, experience and work in this space. But um, Christina, perhaps following up on what you said, in as you probably touch different boards across different sectors and, and geographies, curious if you see any commonality of issues and sort of what are the top um, the more prevalent uh, ESG-related issues that come on, on the board agenda today? Well, reporting. <laughs> I would say that that's number one. I would say the second one is is people, HR related. Um, so diversity, equity, inclusion. I think one of the most dangerous things that I've observed um, is companies that have a push towards diversity, but leave out the equity and inclusion piece. I think that that actually can do more harm than good. Um, Fabrice, I'd, I'd love for you to comment on the LGBT part of that equation, but I, I think that all of the minority groups that are represented and hope to be better represented, I think, need to um, not just be presented with opportunity, but be appropriately mentored and included in strategic decision making conversations, not be included in a meeting whereby the actual decisions get made by a subset of that group. Yeah, you know, and I think that's such a, a, a crucial point you're making, because, you know, we have seen indeed progress I think, in the, at the board level on diversity. But then now we're kind of hearing that, you know, the women, as an example, that have joined the board have not been sharing committees, right? Or their voice tend to be marginalized in the conversation. And, and that, you know, that's exactly what you described, right? The risk of having diverse voice in the boardroom, but that have actually no impact on the discussion. And, um, and I think, you know, that the next... That's the next step when we look at board diversity, which is to ensure that there is not just tokenized diverse people in the boardroom, but that they are actually chairing committees and chairing the board and, uh, and, that, and that others are making room for them to express opinions. Um, so I love that you're making that point, you know, between uh, the, the difference in the corporate setting between, you know, um, diversity and inclusion. Um, but I think from I mean, what I would love to also you you know shared with us earlier uh, sort of your uh, different uh, roles and backgrounds both in setting the standards in integrating sort of broader um, equality policy equality focused policies in uh, nonprofit and corporate sector uh, Fabrice so wanted to your take um, on some of the best practices in in that area and maybe some anecdotes to share on what's worked particularly well. Or where there is, you know, I, th I think we all agree that there is still a lot of room for for improvement. But uh, would love you for you to, sh to share any examples. Well, you know, so, so I'm the director of an ETF, uh, which is which is attempting to have an impact on LGBTQ plus people, and, and you know, in a way, it's a bit gimmicky, right? Because today, uh, today it's difficult to find uh, to find people that are willing to invest their money to advance LGBT causes. But the idea is to say. Look, the vast majority of LGBTQ plus people in the world, right, outside of the United States, of Europe, and some, some parts of Latin America, are living short and British uh, lives without dignity and opportunity. 
And so can we use our capital to invest in companies that actually have a positive impact on LGBTQ plus people, whether it is by, you know, representation in the executive committee or by their philanthropic engagement or maybe by their marketing engagement or by their commitment to diversity within the company. Um, and, uh, you know, and in a way it's replicating something that has, uh, that has had a positive impact on race and gender because we are more evolved in uh, doing impact advancing, impact investing to advance uh, the human rights of women and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, marginalized, uh, marginalized racial uh, communities. And so, you know, I think it's only the beginning in a way, particularly on my niche topic, which is uh, LGBTQ uh, issues. But I love this idea that if governments are not bringing solutions fast enough, which is the case for LGBTQ plus people, right? The vast majority of LGBTQ plus people live in places where they are criminalized. And if governments are not advancing fast enough, then can we make sure that finance is part of the solution to advance what is one of the biggest social challenges of our time? Um, so even though it's, it's kind of the beginning, I, I can see how despite looking a bit gimmicky at the moment, it could turn into something that has a concrete impact on the lives of LGBTQ plus people. No, certainly. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, the, the, the road is uh, probably long ahead. And I think they're also, we'll also be looking at the role of finance, um, probably at different points of intersection and also starting probably earlier um, in sort of in investments in earlier education models as well and making sure that there is direct integration, um, you know, into the workforce sort of at the pre-university, university level. And I think it's uh, it's just kind of setting those standards um, in, in procedures early on, I think is particularly important. Um, uh, Christina, I would love to to come to you. And, uh, you know, one of, again, our, our earlier conversations was focused on um, measurement and, and, and metrics. And I think um, setting there is sort of a broader proliferation. I think if you look at it through the lens of uh, net zero commitments, sort of you know, the, the, the greenwashing um, aspect and the social washing. And I think uh, with the proliferation of ESG reporting and commitments that are coming to light, um, I think there is probably an even heightened need to, to create more effective measurement systems. So we'd love um, your perspective on what you're seeing. Um, and again, some of the best practices in the reporting um, space and also how 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 do you measure uh, the impact of um, of ESG strategies sort of in, in the corporate setting? Yeah, I think it it certainly does depend a little bit whether we're talking about public companies or private companies. I'll speak to private first. I would say, um, well, across both, uh, frankly, the um, industry specific standards for reporting tend to largely pull from uh, SASB. So I think SASB has really led the charge um, on supporting in, in industry specific metrics. I think where industry agnostic metrics vary um, between public and private, um, I think within public, again, still voluntary, we're seeing, um, you know, virtually 100 percent of the Fortune 500 companies do report um, and they're voluntary. Sometimes they are cherry picked marketing data. Sometimes they are, you know, they're really um managed by their peer set. Um, so you, you don't want to be competing in an industry where your peers are put together substantive or very comprehensive reports on ESG where you're falling short. Um, it, within the private space, um, I would say it's it's a little bit more nuanced only because the uh, stage of, of growth does matter. I was just on the phone this morning with a, a venture capital firm that would like to institute ESG reporting across their portfolio companies. But we're talking about, you know, startups in Israel. We're talking about, you know, India-based um, technology companies. Um, and I think the standard will be slightly different, but there are absolutely, and, and I have developed with my prior company, um, and Novata has certainly developed its own, um, you know, standard for where can we create uniformity? I think one thing that we can all agree on across public and private is that there is a strong desire for standardization. Um, I think companies feel so much pressure at this point to report that I think it would just be, frankly, relieving to a lot of the executive teams and boards if if somebody could just tell them what needs to be reported. Um, because at, at the moment, I think it's just sort of, you know, gathering what what they're what they're capable of um, or or what they're being asked for. 
Um, and, yeah, and, and if I may add something, you know, I, I think on the social in aspect, I constantly have companies that ask me about indexes, right? And they say, is there a global index that I could feel so that people know whether I'm LGBT friendly or not? And very often that's not the case, right? The UK has its own index called Stanwall. In the United States, we have the Human Rights um, Campaign Corporate Equality Index. In Australia, you have Pride in Diversity that has its own index. And, and you know, there's probably eight or nine indexes uh, that, that a global company would have to feel if it wanted to inform uh, investors, consumers, and employees about what it is doing on social issues. And, um, and so, you know, it's a lot of uh, manpower to fill all of the questionnaires. And also, frankly, it doesn't capture everything that companies are doing. So companies that can, that maybe have a hundred percent in the United States on the corporate equality index might actually be doing very poorly in Indonesia, but nobody is capturing that information. And so I, I, I agree with what Christina is saying, which is that, you know, first of all, it plays a huge burden on companies to come up with their own way to express what they are doing. But also, it means that the investor, the consumer, and the employee does not have a full picture of what's happening in the company on their engagement, whether it's on the environment, or on social issues, or on governance. So standardization of reporting is definitely something that we require to invest in. Um, and actually, you know, what's, what's interesting to me, I think beyond the, the reporting standards, and I also want to come back to, to this question later on, because there is also proliferation of sort of more unified mechanisms, like, you know, the, the stakeholder capitalism uh, metrics that the World Economic Forum is uh, um, is developing. Uh, but Fabrice, um, you have sort of previous uh, background in multilateral organizations, both working with the UN and the World Bank. And I'm curious... Um, not in context of reporting, but in the context of standard setting um, and sort of the role of those multilateral organizations in setting standards and upholding them that then also connect and sort of tri trickle down to, to, to the metrics part. Well, I have to say that I love this question. It's actually very timely because the Asian, Asian Development Bank is reviewing its uh, safeguard at the moment, which is, you know, maybe something that happens every 10 or 15 years. And in that case, civil society usually tends to put pressure on adding safeguards or refining safeguards. But you know, I'll tell you something, maybe the, the, the one point that I would like to make is that multilateral, uh, multilateral organizations are not very courageous. And so they tend to kind of do the minimum. And the push comes from outside, right? From civil society. It's civil society that will say, look, you need to have a standard on the impact you have on indigenous people. You know, for years, company, uh, for years, you know, development investment would have negative impact on the indigenous community, and nobody cared until civil society told company you need to have a safeguard. So, you know, even though it's a very technical and obscure world, this, this performance standard and safeguard world, I think, you know, it's very important. And, you know, nonprofit like OSF or uh, the Bank Information Center in Washington, D.C., will be putting pressure on, um, on the, on the development banks and the international uh, financial institution to be a little more courageous and to set the bar a bit higher. And it does have an impact be on the private sector because the Asian Development Bank co-invests with a lot of private companies. The World Bank co-invests with a lot of private companies, but it also has an impact on government, on, on governments, right? The governments will see that the standards exist and then will try to emulate it in their laws or their own investment. So it's actually, it's actually kind of this obscure, boring world that, that does matter. Uh, and, 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 you know, my point is to say very often the impulse comes from outside, right, the nonprofit world. And I think, you know, Christina, you might agree with me, but it's a bit the same thing in the private sector, which is that the regulator has to step in because a lot of companies are very happy that nobody can really measure what they are doing. And once, you know, there is transparency, some are going to lose and some are going to come uh, to come out winners. And so uh, so I think the regulator has a role to play. Well, absolutely. I mean, Christina, curious for your perspective. I mean, you come more from a private sector uh, world, uh, but sort of on the role of the multilateral um, community in, in, in setting those standards and kind of creating more of a, uh, you know, pressure on uh, operational uh, environments where, where companies uh, play. So any perspective there? Yeah, I think Europe and UK have led, have led um, 
the, the US in many ways through by example in terms of the standards that they've set and uh, regulation that they've passed, incentives um, from a tax perspective that they've given to companies to to move the needle in the area of impact. Um, so I think that um, it, it's expected that we may not follow suit in the exact way, but we certainly are um, are you know usually a step behind. But I think you know acting appropriately in terms of understanding that these are companies that are operating on the inter international level um, and that um, we want to do more than just comply with European standards. We want to set our own. I agree. Yeah. If, if I may add something, Christian, you know, something that really struck me in the past few days is that California repealed the law that yes. had mandated minimal representation of women on board. Yeah. And to me as a European, it's, it's, um, it's really shocking, right? Because Europe has had standards on representation of women on corporate boards for sometimes more than 10 years. You know, France, as an example, requires 40% representation. I think Europe is starting to think about having a blanket 40% requirement. And, and the, the discussion in, in, in the US, besides the unconstitutionality of the law, is to say, look, the government is being too intrusive. But there is nothing intrusive about the government saying, look, it has been years that we tell you, you have to have governance mechanisms that are representative of society. And if you're not doing it, if you're persisting in excluding women from the economy and from decision making, we will have to step in. To me, it's really baffling that in 2022, there is still resistance in the United States to have a fair representation of women on the corporate board. And so, I, you know, I, I completely agree with Christina on this view that, you know, we don't have to let Europe be the champion of a fair and just economy. I think this also puts um, private, you know, the private sector in, in a power position. I think companies should, you know, react appropriately um, to to this um, and, you know, there are companies like NASDAQ that will take take measures, um, you know, it, take it in their own hands to, to basically set set certain expectations and standards. Um, I, I can appreciate that for many minority groups, quotas have, you know, always been viewed as a negative. There are certainly plenty of groups that will make the argument that they are positive and necessary for progress. So I think we need to see a balance. I think both sides need to enter into the equation. Uh, it would be nice if it weren't if it weren't a legislative mandate, um, but the private sector simply isn't doing enough, and that's when legislation is meant to insert itself and be supportive in making progress. Well, I completely agree, and in a way, maybe the message is: look, if you if you are not making the effort of of adjusting your operation and reporting about it, then you don't leave any choice but for the regulator to step in. But, and it's true that we have seen companies that actually go above and beyond the requirements. And one of the things that was very encouraging was when the United States pulled out of the Paris Agreement and companies said, we will still comply. Mm -hmm. That was a signal that, that companies understand that they have responsibilities on the environment, on human rights, independently of what is the legislation. You know? And that was very encouraging. No, absolutely. And I think I would probably say two things to that point. One, um, on the on the gender quota and just broadly, uh, we're seeing a lot of sort of pressures that are bubbling up that from bottom up from employees, sort of broader kind of community and societal issues that are shifting um, corporate action. And I think, you know, you've mentioned uh, NASDAQ, Christina, in terms of the standards that they've been setting. But then Goldman Sachs quickly followed suit in terms of announcing that they will not be investing in companies that don't have certain um, or diversity and, and representation. And so I think we're we're seeing um, kind of bottom up and top down uh, trends in this space. And I think to, to your point uh, for recent corporate activism, and that's actually, you know, an area that I wanted also to touch on in our conversation. You know, I think case in point, nobody has expected that there will be such a widespread private sector pullout from, from Russia following the invasion and the war. And I think it was um, unprecedented in a, in, in a positive way. And I think many companies um, sort of looked um, at their peers and at the example, and I think moved a lot swifter um, than anybody would have been, uh, anticipated. And so that brings me to, to my question and sort of what you're seeing in your line of uh, work. 
um, in trends, you know, has has there been an increase uh, over the last um, two years in corporate activism and companies taking active stand on certain issues? Um, I mean, it, it seems that in the last two years we've been living in a conflict crisis, constant crisis prone uh, world. So it might seem that you know there there you know there is a almost you know every month a crisis to react to. But curious for for your take on sort of the the intensity of it all over the past two years compared to perhaps maybe five years back. You know, what, what I found interesting, and I would love to hear the, your thought on the thought of Christina, and it was the Disney story in Florida a few months ago, right? People interpret it in very different manner. Some people see it as companies pulling out of the discussion on human rights, and others see it at that moment where Gen Z is sending the message to the private sector you know, you have responsibilities. And if you don't fulfill those responsibilities, we will, you know, as employees, consumers and investors, uh, we will take action. You know, my view, my view is that it, it's probably a changing world, right? In which capitalism is changing to be more responsible. And, and when Bob Chapek, the president of, of Disney, said, look, when companies, when companies take a stance on these issues, it's actually a disservice to the issue. I don't think that's true. I actually think that in a world where governments and the media and other institutions have less uh, power and have, have lost a lot of trust from the public, the private sector finds itself in a situation where it has to take a stance on those issues, right? Because the house is on fire. If you, if you think about the environment, the house is on fire. If you, think, if you think about racial equality in the United States, the house is on fire. And so... You know, people will go where they have agency and they have agency with the private sector. No, certainly. Christina, I'm curious for your take. Um, I I just noticed that um, Natalie has posed a question. No, no, I, 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 no, 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 no. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute as well. Oh, okay. No, I, I, um, I agree. I think uh, you know, Disney is a good example. Um, I think that... Um, you know, just to circle back to a prior point, um, the, the millennials and Gen Zs, you know, previously there was a lot of, there was a lot of discussion around today. It's the great resignation, but previously it was, um, the, the great wealth transfer. Um, and when I started my business, that was something that really motivated asset managers, you know, public, uh, private credit and private, um, private equity managers to cater to the, the interests of these, um, you know, large family offices and, and over time, more substantial pools of capital. Um, it had a lot to do with the fact that they understood that we've got an aging population and that there's a younger generation that's inheriting a substantial amount of capital. And they, um, they have no problem taking a, a job with a lower pay that gives them more purpose and um, gives them more of a voice uh, in terms of what they, what they, um, you know, consider important um and they they um they influence the markets with their dollars no certainly i think it's uh it's definitely a very interesting trend. I think that Natalie asked a question, but then I don't know if she's, if she's still with us or not. But the question was, um, if there is a good overview that links impact of the declaration of investors and the actual investment portfolios in women-led founders against uh, uh, ventures, I guess uh, kind of brings us back to our earlier question in terms of uh, measurement and, uh, and, and traction. And I think we, we all know the sort of the sad statistics that uh, women-led companies and women founders are significantly under invested. That I'm not gonna, you know, you, you use daunting figures, but I think we all know them. Um, but curious to see, you know, maybe on your perspective on whether or not this trend is on the reverse. I think we're seeing female-led uh, funds like um, Elvest and uh, and several others. Um, so, is the tide turning from your perspective? Well, I, I mean, you know, looking at. Uh... You know, to me, there is there is a there is, a, there is positive development, and I think companies are increasingly uh, trying to do the right thing. You know, and similarly, uh, you see investment funds that will develop specific products, at least to showcase that they are paying attention to where the money is being invested. Um, so, I, you know, I see progress. Um, but I feel that, in a way, uh, the most important aspect is going to 
keep companies accountable. Uh, and, and, you know, one issue that I have is, is you know, I'm, we have been trying to get boards to disclose the sexual orientation and gender identity of their board members. And they have been very resistant. And, and I think, you know, you know, one of the reasons is because they don't really feel the pressure, the external pressure. And, uh, and you know, a, a lot of what I'm thinking about is that what would be useful is to segregate the company that do. Because every year there is maybe in Fortune 500, there's maybe 10 more companies that decide to disclose the sexual orientation and gender identity of their board member. And I think we are in the community, we have not been very good at saying, you know, bravo, Bank of America, having taken that step to add sexual orientation and gender identity to your, diversity, your board diversity guidelines, because it does matter. And because ultimately, uh, that's how we are going to make progress on the marginalization of LGBTQ plus people. And I know that sometimes it sounds a little bit frivolous, but I wanted, I have to place that figure, which is that out of 5,670 seats on Fortune 500 companies, only 30 are occupied by out LGBTQ plus people. Uh, wow. which is incredibly small, right? That, that's less, that's less than <laughs> percent. And as you know, LGBTQ plus people are probably closer to five or seven percent of the population. Oh, wow. No, it's quite a staggering statistic. I know we're almost at time. And so I want to, to wrap up, I guess, with uh, what's, uh, what are you optimistic about in the, you know, sort of in the, in the next uh, 12 months ahead and in, um, in the space of uh, increased focus on ESG, but also um, impact investing that is ESG focused on the rise. So what, what makes you optimistic? I would say... Um... 2007-8 taught me a lot about the nice-to-haves versus the need-to-haves um, in the investment um, space. And I think that we should expect that, you know, we may be in the beginning of or will experience a sharp correction. And so that will be very telling, um, you know, what are these companies truly prioritizing versus how are they using the capital that has been sitting on the sidelines you know, the extra capital that they're now putting to use. Um, <clears throat> is it, you know, a glitzy marketing campaign or is it substantive? Um, I think one thing that I'm very optimistic about is that <clears throat> the, the pressures of the millennial and Gen Z generations is not going away. It will continue to accelerate, frankly, and they will continue to have more power and more of a percentage of global capital to influence their preferences and their preferences absolutely speak to a lot of the things that we've touched on today, um, which trend more towards, you know, ESG as a top priority. So I'm very optimistic about that. And I'm very optimistic that the, um, the U S will <clears throat> over time um, sh show, um, you know, more, um, more of a priority on um, ESG reporting, um, whether we start with public companies or not. Um, I think the point is um, this voluntary exercise uh, will soon, you know, become an obligation and, and in so doing, we'll hopefully standardize so that we'll see the sort of gap equivalent of ESG one day. Okay, no, definitely. So uh, increasing regulatory pressures and bottom up pressures from um, employees, current and future. Fabrice, uh, in 30 seconds or less. Yeah, in 30 okay. seconds, I would say, you know, that institutional investors are starting to be the one putting pressure on a lot of public companies. And, and, and you know, I find that uh, very encouraging. And I think this is going to continue. Excellent. Well, thank you both very, very much for persevering with the uh, you know, technology difficulties and uh, just having such an insightful conversation. And uh, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for, for having us. Thanks.